What I love is it's so disposable. I mean, sometimes I buy it and throw it away. Don't even look at it. I wish I'd write more about Norfolk. Oh, I won't buy it every day. They use some good words. You can never find where anything is. It's like supermarkets. They move articles around so you'll buy more. Contents page. In your award-winning quality, Quality Sunday Sunday format this week. Quality. Our new section devoted entirely to quality. Including. Justin Briggs on quality food. Cars. Angela Summersby on quality motoring. Property. Clarence Hardiman on quality streets. Frank Dawes, a day on the dark side. Each week, Frank Dawes spends a day on the dark side of life. Last week, he was homeless for a day. This week he spends the day being unemployed. With unemployment rates going down all the time, I began to wonder what it must feel like to be cast aside by the world of work. In the interest of research, my editor agreed to sack me for a day. This is my diary. 8 a.m. Although there is no reason to get up, no reason even to wake up, I force myself into my usual routine. I look out of the window and watch people walking purposefully in the street. Are they going to work, I wonder? Can't help feeling resentful. What have they got that I haven't? A job, of course. Ten coffees. Latte. Frappe. Espresso. Espresso bongo. Cappuccino. Cipuccino. Radicchio. Sparkling. Vanilla. Irish. Mexican. Industrial. Ten former celebrities due for a comeback. Margaret Thatcher. 9 a.m. Margaret is very understanding. I offer to cook breakfast, but she insists. Can't I at least do something useful? I snap unkindly. She points to a shelf I've been promising to put up for months and a fuchsia that needs repotting. 11.05. Sit in the kitchen, drink tea, and smoke roll-ups. How long will it be before I watch daytime TV? 11.35. Watch daytime TV. Do well on some quizzes. With my intelligence, I ought to be doing something useful with my life. Margaret is busy, busy, busy with the kids. She has a role, a function. It's all right for her. One o'clock. We go shopping and row about money at the checkout. We can't afford the soft stuff anymore, I snap. You'll have a job soon, darling. Tomorrow, in fact, Margaret replies sympathetically. But how long would her faith in me last? 2.30. Bored, bored, bored. So bored, I decide to help out a bit with the kids. Have another row with Margaret. 3.40. Repot the fuchsia. I'm working again, making a contribution. But what's the point? 4 o'clock. Go to the park and wander about. Meet some kids and hang around the bus shelter for a bit. Buy some chips for the way home. 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. Telly, telly, and more telly. 11.30 p.m. As the day draws to a close, my optimism returns. I would be going to work tomorrow as a highly paid journalist. Besides, I was lucky. At least my day's unemployment had been a Sunday. But has unemployment changed me? It has certainly altered my attitude to work. That is because I have walked on the dark side. Next week, Frank Dawes spends a day in solitary. Complacency. Today's must-have. How many of us hear the words, we can't afford to be complacent every day? Whether it be from a spokesman for rail track or a working-class father of three. But is complacent really something we can't afford to be? Three London-based office workers give their views. Tom Maybe. Top left. 33, IT consultant. I've worked hard in the IT industry for 10 years. My father keeps warning me that I can't afford to be complacent, but the fact is I can. I've budgeted for it. Alice Small. Top right. 29, toy buyer. I'm utterly complacent. It's a great feeling. It's a little like being smug, but without the stigma. And it is less annoying. Victoria Wallace. Bottom right. 25, fashion PR. I feel I can afford to be complacent, and people who resent that are usually jealous, or of a generation that thought it was wicked or strange. E millionaire. When it comes to making money, it's not casino chips, but silicon chips that give the best return. Sarah Willoughby meets the new entrepreneurs. Simon Branch is in many respects a typical company chairman. He has a chauffeur-driven limo, a platinum Amex card, and thinks nothing of spending several hundred pounds on a meal. When I phone to arrange this interview, Simon's personal assistant has considerable trouble finding a window in his busy schedule. Because Simon is currently revising for a maths test and has an important assignment about David Copperfield to hand in. Simon is 15, and like an increasing number of young people, his childhood has been spent playing Join the Dotcoms. Shortly after beginning his fourth year at Nother Tyneside's Winnie Mandela Comprehensive, Simon started up Cramster.com, a new internet service allowing high school pupils to freely share the answers to exam questions. I could see there was a market for it, explains cigar-smoking Simon, who along with his entire class and 300,000 other registered Cramster users is predicted to get nine-star day grades in his forthcoming GCSEs. The business plan was simple, raise 200 quid in venture capital, pay the teachers to let me copy the answers and upload them onto the World Wide Web. 
with downloaded answers starting at 30p for a binomial equation, up to £15.99 for a detailed character analysis of the second grave digger in Hamlet with relation to Shakespeare's use of dramatic irony. Health Style, the Sunday format's Health Style Consumer Guide. Nutty about acorn juice. Although still only available by mail order from Carey's Health Food Shop in Primrose Hill, acorn juice is fast becoming the drink of the millennium. Not as sweet as cranberry, there are delightfully rich oaky notes and even a touch of acorn. Who wants wood? Everyone would. You can now find wood pulp next to the tofu in most good health food shops. It's made from organic wood from renewable forests and can be used to add weight to any stew or as a meat substitute can also be used to fill small cracks in floorboards. Simon quickly raised enough funding to expand his database. The site now covers almost the entire GCSE syllabus, except some particularly difficult bits of relativity theory. The information superhighway was, quite literally, the road to success for Simon, and there are plenty more fish in the same boat. I actually thought of the idea on the loo. Mumbles Adrian Jevons, 13, founder of Anacornacova.com, a site devoted to his favourite female tennis player. Displaying surprising manual dexterity for someone with such podgy fingers, portly Adrian guides me through the site which for several months now has been a labour of love. Within a week, I had more than 500 photos of Anna on my webpage. Grins the enterprising, if somewhat portly, young man, who built his site literally single-handedly and admits he doesn't have time for a girlfriend. But before discovering the internet, Adrian was just a spotty-skinned Norman no-mates with little hope for the future. The kids at school used to pick on me all the time for being interested in computers, explains the roly-poly youth, whose bedroom is plastered with pin-ups of female tennis players scratching their bottoms. Since he became an e-millionaire, however, all that has changed. Now they just pick on me all the time for being dead rich. Profility. Celebrity at home. Interviewing Gavin Spence at home is always a daunting experience. Yet how else can one understand the author of The Killing Fields of Chew Magna and A Treehouse for Mr Biscuit without exploring his most intimate nooks and crannies? But the internet isn't just for youngsters. Robert and Charlotte Kennedy Martin are proving that the hunting, shooting and fishing set can also enjoy surfing. As the brains behind search engine ooyah.co.uk, they're the more mature face of cyberspace. We're certainly no whiz kid teenagers. I'm 35. Admits Charlotte, 43. Robert, also 43, is sanguine about the couple's reported worth of £50 million. Pounds. Yeah, a bit of a shame, though. We used to be worth £70 million before we got into the internet. Buffy here. Charlotte indicates her much older husband. Has always wanted one of those pocket-sized organisers. Robert nods in agreement. A Filipino housemaid, yeah. They hoped the net would ease their frustration, but the final straw came when Charlotte keyed in the words Arab stud and was confronted with some grossly improper information. Yeah. She reminisces. The Spences reside in a grand yet modern modest seven-bedroom split-level maisonette townhouse cottage apartment on the outer limits of the inner city central suburban gyratory. Ten children's names. Elizabeth. Sergio. Hoxton. Rocket. Parmesan. Ridiccio. Spartacus. Ikea. Santa Margarita Ligura. Gary. Dot. Com. Ten dinner party guests. Elizabeth. Sergio. Hoxton. Rocket. Parmesan. Ridiccio. Spartacus. Ikea. Santa Margarita Ligura. Gary. Dot. Com. Her husband interrupts, eager to promote their new business. Inspired by the success of Yahoo.com, Ooya is a personalised search site for the over-affluent. Everyone who signs up gets their own stately homepage, reveals Robert, his wife adding, The oak panel door is opened from the inside, and I'm given a friendly greeting from Gavin's second wife called Angelina. His first wife called Angelina is no longer married to him anymore. Angelina guides me good-naturedly through the Sanderson wallpapered hallway and into the living room. Gavin walks across the hand-woven Persian rug and beckons me to a seat. There's a gleaming Chippendale in the corner behind the indoor clematis, but a Parker Knoll swivel chair stands invitingly close to where the man who wrote Liberty Bodice Swerve has set... Sections of the Sunday format are carefully collated at our print centres and news agents. If any section of your Sunday format is missing, do please let us know and we will try to trace it for you. My interview with Tommy Bridgman, baby-faced entrepreneur behind just 5 yearscom the site which automatically programmes your video whilst you're out by sending a five-year-old round to do it, was regrettably cancelled due to his mum sending him to bed for throwing a tantrum. So to paraphrase the old maxim, the geek shall inherit the earth. Nice to see you again, he remarks. Does he mean it, or is he just being polite? I tell Gavin I can't help thinking Angelina's taste in rustic soft furnishings sits uncomfortably in the living room of a man who could write Rise and Fall of the Hackney Empire. Gavin laughs.
casually brushing his hand against the back of the tasteful cream leather Habitat sofa that sits provocatively at right angles to the Steinbeck piano, where a copy of Chopin's Mazurkas nestles languidly against the Boozy and Hawks music stand, located generously four square alongside the mahogany teak bookcase and Mexican rubber cheese plant. Ten vegetarian footballers. Sammy McPhee. Notts County. Lee Dobson. Arsenal. Christy Mew. Ipswich Town. Kierton F. Betich. Brighton and Hove Albion. Occasionally eats fish. Martin Moses. Walsall. Murray Potts. Kilmarnock. Jeff Bean. Oldham Athletic. Occasionally eats fish. Tony Summerfield. Southampton. Fruitarian. Gary Thomas. Charlton Athletic. Jason Gardner. Swindon Town. I suggest to Gavin that Mahogany Teak is an unusual choice of bookcase for the writer of Laburnum Holocaust. In Angelina's day, that would never have made it through the front door. I don't really see what this has to do with my book. His laughter rings out playfully, echoing across to the Linton Starkey mantelpiece, where the Clarice Cliff vase stands magnificently adjacent to a bold yet amusingly amateur wedding photograph of Gavin and Angelina. Any memory of the previous Angelina has been erased from this room, I point out, citing a particularly striking Edward Hopper on the back wall that I notice, since I last came here, has now been replaced by a Panamanian birthing rug. Oh, that, he announces airily, gazing into the middle distance at the modestly framed Victorian hearth mirror in the alcove between the busy nest of occasional tables and the Papua New Guinean throw. Angelina took it away, which is fine. Angelina never liked it anyway. Can we talk about my new book now? Of course I say. Tech, no babble. School's out. Jennifer Klotz and Polly Jago look at some of the best gadgets on the market to make sure your kids play safely this holiday. Shake and sack. No more naughty nanny nappies. Worried your au pair might be harboring concealed sadistic tendencies? Avoid traumatic incidents of shaken baby syndrome and tedious legal battles with these motion-sensitive disposable diapers. Sold in packs of 12 only. Twinkle Twinkle Freddy Star is the achingly metaphorical tale of a middle-aged author embarking on a new marriage. I wonder aloud, which is just as well, otherwise he would never have heard the question if I hadn't, if the photo on the back cover, which I recognise as being taken in this room, might have given us a finer insight into the man if he had posed by the Sir Russell Makepeace Victorian fireplace. I think you should leave now, he mutters, a typical cry for help, I realise. My questioning has made him uncomfortable, an acknowledgement, perhaps, that Angelina, for all her faults, gave a visual domestic backdrop to his narrative that Angelina could never duplicate. Just shut up about my house. That famous, completely unprovoked temper comes to the fore. He throws a cushion in my direction, which I recognise instantly as from the John Lewis Japanese waterprint collection. If you thought there was an end to the list of unlikely venues being reclaimed as domestic spaces, think again. Katie Shand reports on the latest edition. Since the 80s, the appetite of chic young urbanites for interesting raw material on which to fashion their own brand of funky des res has seemingly known no bounds. We've seen schools turn into semis, monasteries into mansions, and old churches reinvent themselves as fashionably gothic gaffs. Now yet another candidate looks set to emerge as the must-have starting point for the intrepid architect. People are converting old houses into living spaces. Estate agent Roy Mackist puts it... People were actually buying these properties in order to adapt them into fully functioning homes. There's obviously something very appealing for the more adventurous buyer, certainly. Sarah and Stephen Mulvey would be the first to agree. They bought their old house in Cheam, Surrey, in 1996. We're both quite unconventional people, I suppose, says Sarah, 31, like Stephen, an accountant for a firm of building surveyors. And we wanted our choice of living space to reflect that. People were amazed when we told them that we were buying an ex-house, but we felt we had the imagination to turn it into something really comfortable and stylish. Advertisement. Properties of the week. One. The Old Bakehouse, Bramdean, Hampshire. This three-bedroom listed 18th century stone-built cottage has been on the market for two months. It needs some modernisation and you'll have to look out for missing stairs, but there are excellent views over open fields front and back. And for someone with a bit of knowledge and time, this could be the perfect weekend. 185,000, Chandler and Ford, Petersfield office. Two. The Old Schoolhouse, Bremdain, Hampshire. This two-bedroom listed 19th century flint-built cottage has been on the market for three months. It needs some modernisation and you'll have to look out for wonky floorboards.
billboards, but there are open views over rolling fields back and front, and for someone with a bit of time and knowledge, this could be a stunning weekend refuge. 158,000 Field and Chandler Petersford office. Three. The old outhouse, Drainbeam, Hampshire. This 19-bedroom listed second-century cottage-built Flint Market has been on the open field for three months. It needs some modernisation and you'll have to look out through rolling windows, but there are weekend views over rear fields front and side, and for someone with a stunning knowledge of time, this could be huge. 851,000. Peters and Field, Chandler's Ford office. Six. The old house house, Dream Brain, Hampshire. The conversion is certainly ambitious. The transformation has been gracefully achieved with the help of architect A.J. Anwar by the addition of an extra layer of perspex panelling onto the walls to emphasise the redefinition of the space. Anwar sees many similar projects coming his way. The advantage with old houses, he explains, as opposed to, say, a warehouse conversion, is that in many of them, some of the facilities, such as plumbing, central heating and so on, that will be required in a modern living space are already basically there. In Sarah and Stephen's case, for instance, just as the company were putting in the cabling for the phone line, the engineer pointed to what looked like a tiny shuttered aperture surrounded by a white box in the skirting board and said, that looks like the original socket. Incredibly, it was. And even more incredibly, still in good working order. We put in the new one anyway, though. Laughs Anwar. Just to be on the safe side. It's great. It really does feel like a house now. Beams a delighted Stephen. Firms like Dorsey Hammond see sales of old houses continuing to rise. So much so that, according to Roy Mackist, there will soon be a shortage of old houses to feed the growing demand. So what would he say to people sitting in their old houses, unaware of the fact that somebody might want to live in them? I'd say get moving. You're sitting on a potential gold mine. Television. The week ahead, ahead. In full, on television, in brief. Walking with Minotaurs. BBC One, Wednesday, 7.30 to 8. The nature documentary about mythical creatures continues. This week, why the Cyclops didn't always see eye to eye. A fight between a griffin and a unicorn and the reproductive cycle of the push me pull you Brilliant effects, but little in the way of real insight. Walking with Aliens. BBC One, Monday. 8.30 to 9. This week, we look at the plight of the telepathic inhabitants of Creelon 5, who are dying due to evolutionary shifts in the ionosphere. And we follow the Talaleans as they prepare to launch their invasion of the planet Farg, revealing, if slightly earnest, walking with subatomic particles. BBC One, Sunday, 7 o'clock. Award-winning series which chronicles the beginning of the universe. This week, we follow the mighty quark as it terrorises a herd of protons gathered round an energy oasis. Compelling, but not for the faint-hearted. Why do they insist on scheduling these sort of shows when most people are eating their dinner? The Changing Face of Britain. Part 3. In our disturbing three-part exploration of The Changing Face of Britain. Above. We explore the disturbing ways in which Britain has changed its face, both superficially and less so, in the last 40 years. This week, employment patterns. Management consultant gurus predict that 90% of white-collar jobs will have disappeared by the year 2000. In fact, management consultancy is predicted to be the only white-collar industry which will still be thriving in tomorrow's Britain in 20 years' time. American management consultant guru Elliot Rajneesh is moving exclusively into the business of training new management consultants in how to train management consultant trainers. Unfortunately, at his alley rate, we couldn't afford to interview him. Nevertheless, all in all, an atmosphere of fear and anxiety pervades the workplace in Britain today. Perhaps this is why Britons are gaining a reputation for working too hard and living too little, which in itself is a recipe for stress, anxiety, excessive drinking, the breakdown of the family unit, paranoia, random violence and insomnia, stress and anxiety. And as we know, all these factors can lead to stress and anxiety which, like a vicious circle, can lead to anxiety, stress and dismissal in a vicious circle. Literality. Literary bad boy Martin Amos has always been good news for bookstores. The novels Night Death, London Time, Night Information, Night Babies and Time's Night have all been bestsellers. On the eve of publication of his new novel, Night, the Sunday format publishes this exclusive extract exclusively. The car roared and sharked and stalked and pounced through London's night zoo, curling up to sleep outside the airport's terminal. Terminal, I thought. Yeah, I thought. I took one last look at London. It was tired, worn out, night fried, night spent. Yeah, London was a city of night. Even during the day it was night, and at night there was nothing to do but scream and smoke and weep and smoke. I lit forty cigarettes and smoked them together. 
Outside, the rain fizzed and hissed and popped. The plane tore through time like an angry missile and dumped me at JFK, feeling shattered and helpless and weak and ghosted and night fevered and post coital and in need of a fag. I was night. One long night. Like London, like New York. New York lay before me like a mashed up London. Double mashed, future mashed, millennium mashed. Man, it was mashed. It made you feel mashed just looking at how mashed it was. I took a carton of 200 duty free Marlboros out of my bag, lit it, and smoked it like an enormous cigarette. Why not? I thought. Shag it. Next week, an exclusive extract from Will Self's new novel, The North London Book of the Dead and the Night Living. Music. CD reviews. Plucket magazines Peter D'Artagnan and Jodie Le Mac continue with their review of the month's best new CDs. PC Gamer magazine March 99 cover CD sampler, various free. Shamelessly unzeigeistful and dripping with memorable cultish romanticism, this alluring smurgers board of a compilation oozes nostalgia, encapsulating a timeless legacy of first cigarette behind the gaming machine's teenage angst. Rating two and a half stars. Cardboard inlay sold as protective packing material with new Sony Disman, Sony £65.99, including new. Sony Disman. If you're into Elton John, Chris Rear, and Beverly Craven, you're a sad little MOR freak who shouldn't be reading the CD reviews at all, but that's beside the point. This gem of a discovery, boasting the most starkly Philip Stark influenced minimal design I've seen in years, could have come from any of the past three decades. This is reminiscent, if anything, of Philip Glass's experimental silent works, and the lascivious primitivism of its nihilistic blankness makes to the must-have for any muso worth his salt. Rating four stars. Health style. News in brief. Die young. It's good for you. New research by the BMA has revealed that, contrary to conventional views, dying young could actually be good for you. Men under 40 who die are dramatically less likely to die in their 50s. Stay alert. Go to sleep. New research has confirmed for the first time that we are most alert when we are sound asleep. According to brainwave patterns of volunteers in deep REM sleep, they are more likely to be able to operate machinery, dance or drive than when they are fully awake. The findings are backed up by statistics. Most accidents happen when people are awake, whereas the chances of having a fatal accident while asleep in bed is very small. The BMA advice to drivers is use a long motorway drive as an opportunity for a bit of shut eye. It'll do you good. Music. CD reviews. Plucket magazines Peter D'Artagnan and Jodie Le Mac continue with their review of the month's best new CDs. Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, Polydor, £9.99. One word, utter rubbish. Neither radio-friendly nor boasting chin-stroking jazz-soaked instrumentals, this stinker is definitely best avoided. Rating, no stars. TDK, CDRW, blank rewritable CD, 720 gigabyte capacity. I used this to record a 90-minute acoustic jamming session from my own Uber Rock Close Harmony, Belgian, Plain Song, White Snake, and Amy Mann inspired four piece thrash rap band Toss. Featuring this reviewer on lead vocals. A limited edition pick of the week, rating five stars. The Essential Kitchen. Part 9 of our 10 part series. This week, kitchen architect Simon Pickup takes a revisionist look at the wooden spoon. Albert Einstein once famously said, God is in the detail. Our essential kitchen is nearly complete. We can turn our attention away from the macro kitchen issues and move to the micro level, the detail. What is it about wooden spoons? Put simply, they're completely useless. They're badly designed, they break easily, they don't come in a variety of colours. And then of course, there's the simple fact that they're made of wood and they're used in conjunction with fire. And yet, despite all this, the humble wooden spoon has remained the all-time number one best-selling kitchen utensil for the last 3,000 years. What is it about wooden spoons? Put simply, it's that they are completely indispensable. They are a design classic. The long, sleek handle, the beautiful bardo-like curves of the face. They look like a million dollars. They're incredibly durable. They don't come in a bewildering array of shapes, sizes and colors, which makes buying them a blessed relief. And they are made of wood, which is great because it means they're completely biodegradable. Prices start at around a pound. Wooden spoon. Picture top right. 99 pence. Any high street branch at the one-stop spoon shop. Although they do go as high as 500 pounds. Antique mahogany wooden spoon. Clockwise, 20 to 4. 500 pounds. Fortnum and Mason. In a world of total, unremitting and complete uncertainty, one thing is certain. Wooden spoons are here to stay. 
In that sense, they are a lot like the emotion we call love. Like love, wooden spoons cause heartache. Like love, they can bring us immense joy. Like love, they can be really, really dull. But like love, the overriding feeling they give us is of just being there, always there. Enduring, perennial, indefatigable. Contemporaneities. Ten things to do this Sunday. Islington International Festival. The Cromer International Boomerang Festival. The Orange Lodges of Northern Ireland Yelling Competition. Grand Finals, Ballymena. Circle of Love. Roll Wright Stones, Wiltshire. Join in this massive grassroots initiative to fill the world with love and harmony by holding hands around a stone with lots of well-meaning people who smile too much. Bring contribution to huge communal picnic, but note, animal food products could provoke violence. A medical doctor of my own. As the beginning of the millennium gropes to its end, health is still the number one issue affecting our physical condition. One of us is ill three times out of every four. Little wonder that more and more of the well-healed are hiring their own personal paramedics. But is the personal paramedic, or pocket doctor, as they're becoming known, little more than a fad for the unhealthy wealthy? Not at all, says Jane and Frank Ibis, when I visited their remote cottage in Tottenham. I was very nearly fatally electrocuted in my own home by a faulty popcorn maker. Now, what if that was to happen again? I might not be so lucky, so it was a wake-up call. But since Dr Evans has moved in with us, I know that if it happens again, he can resuscitate me in a matter of seconds. Life and death are important issues to the Ibises. We've always felt strongly about life. Declares Frank. And death. Adds Jane, with obviously dyed hair. It's also important for our children. Adds Frank, once seen. June 11th, Manchester Piccadilly. You, very pretty. Can't remember exactly what you looked like or what you were wearing. Me, man in suit. Please write, box 4918. Once seen. August 22nd, Edgware Road Tube. You, delightfully plump girl, me, svelte blonde. You didn't say anything, but I felt like I really knew you. You remind me of last great love. I will worship you as a god. Want to meet up? Box 1040. Once seen. May 24th, Waterloo Station. You, pretty blonde girl in navy blue dress. Me, black jeans, grey t-shirt, white hair, one eye, no nose. Want to meet up? Box 5535. Once seen. We move down a winding staircase to the basement, which the Ibises have converted into a bijou emergency room with built-in kitchenette. Dr. Evans eats and sleeps here, although he is allowed in the garden on weekdays before six. This is quite a departure for me. Admits Evans, a former senior consultant house registrar at St. Thomas's Hospital for Sick People. When I first met the Ibises, I wasn't sure what I was taking on or whether this was the right move. I can't have a laugh with my colleagues or go to the bar after work, but there are benefits. See list opposite. I'm looking forward to the day when a real emergency happens and I can prove that it's all been worth it. If I mess it up and someone dies, I can always go back to St. Thomas's. A nation of people. Are we becoming a nation of people? Are we becoming a nation of people? Ask Zoe Bailey. The more dinner parties I go to, the more I realise that I'm conversing with people, whether they like to admit it or not. People are everywhere. Offices, shops, bars, even my own home. Sexy women are less attractive. A recent scientific report has revealed, almost for the first time, that sexy women are actually less attractive than women who are sexy.